Welcome back to The Charismatic Voice. We recently did Dream Theater on the channel for the first time, and from that, so many awesome things happened, including the chance to get to interview James Labrie. So today, we're not just releasing one video, but we're releasing two. This one and an interview with James Labrie right after it. And to prepare for that interview, which I have not done yet, I am following your advice and going back and listening to one of the earlier songs that James Labrie sang with the band from before he had his food poisoning. He had food poisoning in 1994. This performance is taken from 1993. That food poisoning uh, caused a rupture in his vocal folds, and that's really scary damage. But he pulled through it, but he still had a ton of performances he did. And he talks about how for eight years, it didn't seem like he was really fully back. And even then, he was being really careful about the high notes afterwards. So I think that this interview is going to be fascinating. It's going to be so much fun to talk about voice not only getting better and healing and what that process is like, but also how that impacts your identity. Because voice is very closely tied with a person's view of themselves. So I'm really excited to get to listen to this version of James, early James, and then get to talk with him about that process of how the voice changed and developed. So today we're going to be listening to Under a Glass Moon. Again, this is taken from 1993. I read the lyrics. They seem uh, difficult to interpret. So we'll continue to go through it together and maybe do some interpreting of our own. Let's get to it. Whoa, the hair. The All right. this is Art Images I'm Wednesday. having hair in me. I appreciate the really unusual drum pattern that's here. Um, and I also love the sort of more epic, long uh, melody that's being played in the guitar as well. Uh, it feels very, uh, very catchy, very sticky. And everyone here looks so much younger than how I was introduced to them. It's almost weird. It feels like we just rewound time, which is really fun. So I've only heard Dream Theater so far in Metropolis Part 1. And then also uh, just an audio recording of The Answer Lies Within, which was gorgeous. So anyhow, let's go back a little bit and then go back. I just love the coordination that you have between the instrumentalists on this one. Wow.
Okay. A lot of interesting differences I hear in the voice here, which, oh, I'm so excited to talk with him about this. And some of these might just be contributed to aging, right? Uh, um, but it sounds like the voice overall just sits a lot higher here. You still hear a lot of that uh, precision that I really appreciated in Metropolis. And in addition to that, um, it sounds like he's more willing to kind of growl uh, into the sound or give it a little more edge. And I wonder if that's something he's a lot more careful about after food poisoning, or if that might just be this song. I haven't heard a huge plethora of their songs, so I think it might be hard to take too many patterns knowing that Metropolis and the answer lies within were already so different. So it sounds like he's got a very wide range of sounds available. Let's go back a little bit though. He already is modifying his vowels really well, which is another thing I really appreciate about what he does. He's smart technically. You kind of have to be smart technically to get through uh, the kind of vocal damage that he experienced. So this is so fascinating to me. Um, beside may instead of beside me, right? It's a good vowel modification right there. Okay, hold on to see more. He's just like hanging out really high. I'm gonna have to turn this on. I, I'm gonna have to check in these notes on the keyboard. Um, he's just hanging out really high there. Like that is, it's like almost like squealing up there or like it has a squeal. Wow, it's really high to be getting those words out. This is even higher, man. <laughs> that I love the way he tossed off the top note there, shadows, and had that grit the entire time. Oh. Wow. <laughs> so right on the top note there, it sounds like it got a, a little too shaky, a little unstable. singing through such a wide range here. It's just, it, it's mind boggling to me how he's able to keep so much volume throughout and keep getting these words out. It's, uh, and the pitches are also not really evident. You know, they're, uh, I don't think that they're easy pitches to just pick out of the air. Uh, it's these lines, these pitches, um, they're difficult. They're really difficult. Uh, it's crazy. It's the instrumentalists here obviously have very complicated things that are happening as well. And it's just, I feel like it's really echoed in his voice. Oh, shoot. That's hard. <laughs> Okay. Man, he's just like, he's just re 
regularly hanging out in an area that most men don't even dare to have, like pop one high note off in. It's it's crazy. He just like stays like always ready to be in that area. He will drop down lower too because it's, it's super rangy, but the tessitura, which means essentially where the voice is hanging out most of the time. So the tessitura of this is stupid high, like stupid high. And then the way that he's weaving in and out of clean and harsh vocals is crazy. Um, or I should say like clean singing and then distortion on top of it. They're not like totally 100% harsh screams, right? Uh, it's just, it's kind of nuts to hear what he's doing. And uh, that top note, by the way, that he hit there was an E5. So that just gives you an impression. I, I wonder if he'll go back up to it. And I think he reported that later E5s were a lot more difficult to do. It's, I'm... I'm really perplexed by how difficult this is to sing and how he's managing it. <sighs> I'll back a little bit. It's almost like a Judas Priest kind of scream up there. Wow. You hear a lot of different tone qualities that he's playing with in here. I feel like as he got older, he ended up playing with that more and more. That You heard that like sort of softer, almost whispered narration quality in the lows. It was very interesting. And overall, it sounds like um, this his voice back then had just uh, like a brighter shimmer on it, essentially. So if I were to look at that, essentially under some sort of frequency imaging, I would see the overtones in the voice, um, like higher ones would shimmer more and lower ones would shimmer more um, now. The overall, it sounds like the voice just got a little more full and deep, essentially. Oh, it's, it's really amazing. You can tell it's the same person, but there is, uh, there is a, a difference. I love his vibrato control. Wait, is that the E again? <laughs> it's an F sharp. Ah, he, wow, he's singing that in full. He's not flipping to falsetto at all, okay? He's still, that's a full belt right there. And he's adding a distortion on it too. Uh, yeah, man, that that really, that's like a Rob Halford kind of scream right there. That's intense. That's really good. That's really difficult. And it was really uh, just clear. It was good. It didn't seem like it was that difficult for him to do. He also looks like he's supporting it well. He's already got a, a lower stance in stage and he's not using his shoulders to go boop, right? When he hits a high note, right? He seems grounded. And even, uh, there's it's kind of a tip that's fun. If you are singing a really high note and you put a hand as if you're moving out and um, continuing to move air the whole time, it can help you continue to support the uh, high note as you're going, basically continue the sound energy so you don't at some point give up and maybe lose the core of the sound or crack. Cool. Running and singing at the same time. Wow. 
Wow. I don't hear any um, footsteps drawing his voice. That's amazing stabilization right there. Just wanted to briefly say, I simply love the way that they play with time signatures in Dream Theater. It's so much fun, um, fun to wrap your head around. And that sounded like it was essentially alternating between two different ones uh, back and forth. And it uh, possibly could have been, uh, could have been three different ones in there. But anyhow, it's really, it's fun. I like that about them a lot. It makes me want to get like super deep and into all of their music. What a great guitar entrance. Such a cool solo. This was something I noticed from Metropolis too. Like, wow, their instrumental sections are, there's so much to chew on, so much to analyze. Um, I I feel like this solo would be really, really, really hard in Guitar Hero. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm gonna go back and listen to it and point out some of the things that I thought were so cool. But it was fascinating the way you would switch from one cool thing to another cool thing to another cool thing. Hard to find a stopping point in that. It's good. <laughs> Okay, so first thing first, I think the entrance is so good, right? It just draws it out and it's like, okay, you know, taking the spotlight, it's here. It's my turn, I'm gonna do something awesome. There's also already so much that's happened. One of the things I think is really interesting about his uh, guitar solo here is that you have a really quick shift from high to low to high to low, and he'll often be alternating between long and short or fast notes too. He has a lot of different alternations, so it's like got lots of really fun things to listen to. Uh, he's constantly moving between ideas. It's almost like, uh, like, multiple personalities are trying to all vie for some space, but they all go together really, really well. So interesting how he went, um, basically took something that was a slightly lower idea and then transposed it up and made it this like epic moment, essentially an epic melody that you could sing back. Love that side there. Ooh, with the crunchy. Ugh. So so cool how you have like essentially arpeggiations that are happening there, and there's a little like distortion that goes right in between. So he's mixing that sound in with this uh, sound that would otherwise be considered almost classical.
Whoa. Oh. So many cool sounds. Oh. Ooh. Whoa. Nice. keyboard solo is also super awesome man the instruments are this I feel like the instrumental solos in dream theater uh, are some of the most enjoyable I've ever heard it's really they're incredible I loved there's a little pitch bending he did in there too which is fun and something you can only do with an electric keyboard unless you want to pop a string in an acoustic piano I totally recommend against that um, <laughs> So I loved that pitch bending element in it. Uh, I love the way that it feels improvisational, kind of akin to jazz, but it's just morphed into something totally different. I'm gonna go back. Let's start with this. Oh. I like the way his fingers look loose there, right? It doesn't look like there's a lot of tension. A lot of times when people try to play fast stuff, they end up like trying to like muscle it out. And if you keep kind of like a little more jiggle in your hand, <laughs> it can be a little bit easier to knock out those really fast notes. And uh, he also has really good hand position. So if he was spreading out like this and going, he wouldn't have the dexterity available. So it's more perched so the fingers can kind of hang a little bit more. a fantastic keyboardist. <laughs> That's awesome. Ooh, key change! Maybe? I love the way that he goes up and still has a lot of uh, a lot of sound. He has to narrow the voice a little bit as you go higher. If you take up like the like really low um, big part of the voice up high, it tends to beat a little too much weight right here to carry up. But he narrows it just a little bit, but there's still a fullness in the sound as he's going up that sounds just glorious. Uh, I also love that he's going over, again, a very large pitch range, but it doesn't sound like it's got a huge uh, boost in dynamic. People are naturally louder when they're higher, so it sounds like he's really continuing a nice phrase throughout the whole thing. <sighs> Oh, nice song note there. Especially right after, so these are long phrases in the first place and he has to have good breath control to do that. But then he does an extra high note and then this high note that's sustained. So really adding that all up together, it's very impressive.
it with that cowbell to, to finish it off there. One more time on that high note. Oh, back a little more. That was such a good recommendation from many of you. I'm so glad I have an understanding better now of where he's come from and how he's developed too. Oh my goodness, it is gonna be so much fun to get to interview James Labrie right after this. Wow, uh, we're gonna have so much to talk about. Very, very impressive range. Uh, not just pitch range, but range of ability within those pitches. Often when you get higher, you have a more limited range of tone qualities available. It's basically at the extreme ends of your voice. You tend to have a limit to how much extra stuff you can do over there, right? So when he's really high, you hear that he can keep it very clean. He can go into this like amazing scream that's just got this, I wonder if that's a written noise or I'm really curious what part of his voice he's using to give that extra distortion on top. It sounds good. And this song is also amazing. I feel like Dream Theater is just, it has some of the most talented musicians out there and they're still playing. Like, wow, wow. It's incredible what they're able to accomplish. The instrumental solos were delightful and complicated and would be really fun to analyze like just one part of it for an hour on its own. <laughs> But I, I have to just say thank you to all of you for recommending that we listen to some early James Labrie. And uh, yeah, you guys have great recommendations. So if you would like to keep making those, please write them down below in the comment section of this video. That is where we look for your recommendations the most. You can also find me here every Monday, Tuesday, and Friday at 8 a.m. Arizona time. That's when we have our live premieres and there's a live chat I'm always there. It's really fun to get to talk to you and just really fun to also listen to your knowledge about music. I always learn things from you in those premieres. You can also find me on Patreon and you can find me at thecharismaticvoice.com where I have courses about music and about singing. So thank you once again for the wonderful suggestion and I hope to see you somewhere soon, maybe in the interview, which is premiering right after this video. See you soon.